Secretary uh, in the Gulf Division in Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. Uh, let me welcome uh, Honorable Minister of State uh, for External Affairs, uh, Shri V. Murli Dharanji, uh, Secretary CPV and OIA uh, in our ministry, uh, Shri Sanjay Bhattacharya Ji, uh, Secretary General of FICCI, uh, all the esteemed panelists who have joined us from uh, various countries in the Gulf, uh, our ambassadors in the Gulf, uh, and viewers on our ministry's YouTube and uh, Facebook channels uh, for this uh, panel discussion uh, on India and the Gulf. Uh, and uh, as all of you know, uh, we are doing these panel discussions in the run-up uh, to the main Pravasi Bharti Divas conference that is going to be held in uh, January uh, 2021 in a month's time. Uh, as uh, all of you know, uh, the uh, topic for the panel discussion this morning uh, is India and the Gulf leveraging energy partnerships, investment opportunities, and emerging technologies uh, for Atmanirbhar Bharat. Uh, we will have another PBD panel discussion uh, today afternoon, uh, wherein we will be focusing on the skill sets that will be needed uh, for Indians for their employment uh, in the Gulf in, uh, in future. Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, let me uh, request uh, Honorable uh, Minister uh, Shri V. Murli Dharanji uh, to make a keynote address at the start of this panel discussion. <laughs> Secretary uh, CPB and OIA in the Ministry of External Affairs, Sri Sanjay Bhattacharya, MD and CEO Invest India, Sri Deepak Bagla, Secretary General of FIKI, Sri Dilip Shinoy. Uh, Joint Secretary in the Gulf Division, Sri Vipul, esteemed panelists from across the GCC countries, our ambassadors and senior officials in the GCC, ladies and gentlemen, namaskaram to all of you. I am pleased to deliver this uh, keynote address on how India and the Gulf countries can leverage their energy partnerships and utilize investment opportunities and emerging technologies towards Atmanirbhar Bharat. As you all know, this panel discussion has been organized in the run-up to the Pravasi Bharatiya Divas 2021, which will be organized next month. As such, one of our main goals is to consult prominent members of the Indian community in the Gulf region on the topic and to connect the community with Prime Minister's vision of Atmanirbhar Bharat. You are all aware of the clarion call given by Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji for Atmanirbhar Bharat even as India was grappling with the COVID-19 crisis. The aim is to make India self-reliant and not self-centered or inward-looking. India's global partnerships and connections will play an important role in realization of the vision of the Prime Minister. We believe that India's unique, historic, close and friendly relations with the Gulf countries place both sides in a position to realize and benefit from an Atmanirbhar Bharat. As Prime Minister has outlined, there are five pillars of Atmanirbhar Bharat, namely economy, infrastructure, technology in governance, demography and demand. It's fairly intuitive to see that the Gulf countries and the Indian diaspora in these countries would relate to each of these five pillars. It's therefore not a surprise that Prime Minister Modi has attached the highest importance to India's relations with the Gulf region. This can be gauged from the fact that since 2014, Prime Minister himself has visited Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia and UAE, thereby strengthening our already strong relations with all these countries. We have also been honored to visit to host visits at the highest level from several Gulf countries in the past few years. Many important agreements and MOUs have been signed especially in the areas of trade and investment, infrastructure, 
energy and strategic sectors and technologies. Our relations with the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Oman have been raised to strategic partnership. Besides our strong and historic people-to-people -people ties, energy has been the mainstay of India's relations with the Gulf countries. 53% of India's oil imports and 41% of gas imports come from the Gulf region. India will continue to need more energy, oil and gas-based, gas as well as renewable, for its development needs. It's therefore a matter of great satisfaction that in the past few years, India and the Gulf countries have deepened their energy relationships and moved from a traditional buyer-seller relationship to a more robust partnership. For instance, UAE for the first time offered Indian companies a 10% concession in the lower Zakum oil field during Prime Minister's visit to UAE in 2018. UAE has also invested in the strategic petroleum reserve of Government of India. A similar agreement was signed with Saudi Arabia in 2019. We also look forward to investments from UAE and Saudi Arabia for the large plant refinery in Maharashtra. In Prime Minister's telephone call with Qatar's Amir on December 8th, both countries resolved to explore Qatari investments in the entire energy value chain in India. The Gulf countries have also been generous in helping India in ensuring oil and gas supplies during the COVID-19 pandemic. Movement towards alternative energy sources is leading to a new partnership between India and the Gulf in renewable energy sources. Collaboration in solar and other renewable energy sources will provide future energy solutions to both sides. UAE, Saudi Arabia and Oman have become member states of the International Solar Alliance which was an initiative launched by India. We are hopeful that other Gulf countries will also become members soon. This will provide us an excellent framework to share experiences and best practices and launch joint projects in the field of solar energy. Both India and the Gulf countries have some of the largest solar parks and have shown leadership in utilizing solar utilizing technology to reduce solar energy cost. I am sure that we could similarly find opportunities to work together in other areas of renewable energy such as nuclear, wind, geothermal and hydrogen. Atmanirbhar Bharat also provides a vision of India's plans to become a $5 trillion economy by promoting Make in India or make or make for the world. In this endeavor, India will be dependent on attracting investments from its partners across the world, but in particular from the Gulf countries. The thrust will be on joint ventures in infrastructure and manufacturing, integrating into supply chains and tapping sovereign wealth funds. Some of the sunrise sectors identified by Government of India and which should be also be looked at by investors from the Gulf include food products, high efficiency solar PV cells, electronic and technology products, auto components, pharmaceuticals, telecom and networking products, specialty steels, white goods and advanced chemical cell battery. I believe that food security and health security could emerge as big areas of cooperation between India and the Gulf. Indian doctors and nurses have already shown their mettle, including in the difficult circumstances of COVID-19 pandemic. Another focus will be on innovation and startups for entrepreneurial collaborations that are future-oriented. The success of Indian startups in IT, e-commerce, hospitality, logistics, and others can 
leverage higher growth and economic ties. The Gulf countries with their surplus capital, open economies and connections with different regions of the world such as Africa, Central Asia and Europe are well placed to partner with India in its quest. This is a win-win proposition for both India and Gulf. We have already seen a quantum jump in investments from Gulf countries, both from sovereign wealth funds and large corporates into India. Abu Dhabi Investment Authority has emerged as a major investor in National Infrastructure Investment Fund and various Indian companies. Another iconic UAE company, DP World, is also investing through NIIF and directly in ports and other companies. Mubadala from UAE is also looking at various opportunities. You would have all seen the announcements from Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund, PIF, in companies such as Reliance and Oyo. Qatar Investment Authority has invested $600 million in two Indian companies. Kuwait Investment Authority has invested more than $3 billion in India. This provides only a snapshot, and I'm sure that we will continue to get more and more investments from Gulf into India. Government of India has already made special desks to look into investments from different countries. It will also be up to the Indian professionals working in the Gulf to keep the decision makers aware of the new opportunities in India. There are plenty of them today and these will continue to grow in future. On the part of Government of India, I can assure you that our government remains committed to further improve ease of doing business and ease of living in India. Government has already brought in path-breaking reforms in several areas of the economy, including relaxation in FDI norms, manufacturing, taxation, banking laws, labor laws, mining and agriculture. We are confident that as normalcy returns after COVID-19 pandemic, we will go back on high economic growth path. While leveraging investments from the Gulf, India should also look at using its own competitive advantage in the areas of technology and human resources. New emerging technologies, especially in ICT, artificial intelligence, blockchain, consultancy, fintech, fintech logistics, edutech, health tech, and biotech have enormous potential. These will promote efficiencies and usher future growth and development. In some ways, we need to transform a segment of our economic interaction to an ahead of the curve partnership focused on technology collaboration. R&D and high capacity intensive projects that drive future oriented growth in this endeavor, we can build on the complementarities between India and the Gulf. India can contribute technology, human resources, and its large market, while the Gulf countries can easily bring in capital and innovation. Cooperation in high technology areas such as defense and space also has special potential to be stepped up. We have cooperation agreements in both sectors with many countries in the Gulf, and we need to use them to forge close partnerships. With the increased participation of private sector in these areas, the potential for cooperation is much higher. In defense, we can expand equipment and armament export, as well as collaborations under Make in India. In space, where we are world leaders, there is potential for training, fabrication, and launch of satellites, use of satellite data and others. COVID-19 caused unprecedented disruption across all sectors across the world. But it has also shown our interdependence, whether it be for energy supplies, food security, medical supplies, or vaccine research and production. India and the Gulf countries have worked together to tide over this unprecedented crisis. 
the gulf countries took great care of the indians in their countries especially during the time we had lockdowns in india i would like to take this opportunity to thank the gulf leadership for their generosity on our part we also ensured that supply chains especially on food and medicines between india and the gulf continue uninterrupted despite the lockdowns in india we also made sure that indian medical professionals are able to return to the gulf countries while showing our interdependence covid-19 also showed that the world needs diverse sources of supplies in all areas and not be overtly independent on overly dependent on one or a few i feel that india and the gulf countries can together provide diversified sources whether in the field of energy food or medicine the challenge is only how we transform and gear ourselves to leverage our position our relations for our benefit and to the benefit of our partner countries on the way towards an atmanirbhar bharat and a 5 trillion dollar economy in the shorter term i am sure today's discussions will bring out some creative suggestions in this regard thank you all well uh, thank you uh, honorable minister uh, for your uh, keynote address uh, we would now want to move ahead on our panel discussion and uh, the first speaker uh, on our panel discussion today morning uh, is mr dilip chenoy who is the secretary general of federation of indian chambers of commerce and industry he is also someone who is uh, very related uh, to the united arab emirates currently because fiki is uh, a partner uh, for the expo 2020 for government of india uh, before joining uh, fiki mr dilip chenoy has also served as md and ceo of uh, nsdc the national skill development corporation has also been uh, involved with various bodies uh, siam harvard business school and he is also advising uh, many of the startups uh, i would uh, now request him uh, to make a few remarks uh, in uh, at the start of this panel discussion thank you uh, thank you very much for that introduction uh, shri purli uh, dharan ji honorable minister of state for external affairs shri sanjay bhattacharya secretary joint secretary shri vipul deepak uh, all the other distinguished uh, heads of mission of uh, in india and our heads of mission in uh, the gulf uh, very good morning uh, to all of you um, it's a privilege to actually uh, participate and address this webinar uh, as the minister said and i want to actually just paraphrase that that our relationship uh, with the gulf uh, focused initially on three broad areas one was trade other was oil and then was the focus on expatriates the traditional thing so it is if i take the acronym you can be toe which is a toe right so we were only exploring the bottom end of the relationship we have not really expanded it uh, to go forward and i believe we need to take this and transform this uh, going forward uh, today the gulf uh, is uh, uh, an extended part of our neighborhood uh, just as we have a special priority uh, for the east we also uh, have it for the arab uh, world in our west look west policy it is uh, reflecting our policy going forward more increasingly as mentioned by the honorable minister our economic engagement is uh, characterized by energy security uh, food security including building a food security corridor uh, human resource exchanges uh, growing trade and investment relationship and building a strong connectivity uh, with the region Uh, traditionally of course uh, the gulf uh, region was key suppliers of energy uh, and also uh, remittances but uh, although hydrocarbons uh, form the bulk of the trade uh, between 52% the basket has diversified in the recent years to engineering goods uh, gems and jewelry precious, precious metals and uh, other areas as the honorable minister said we have a lot of uh, sovereign funds also investing uh, in uh, india 
the nature of the partnership has actually evolved from mere buyer and seller uh, in and you know participation in the upstream and downstream projects and joint ventures in refineries and of uh, building strategic oil reserves uh, we are also uh, have a investment and a partnership uh, in renewables and of course as the minister mentioned uh, I, I, you know uh, the cooperation under the umbrella of the indian international solar alliance where we also request other countries to actually uh, join i think the sovereign wealth funds over the last few years have been investing uh, we have uh, looked at the positive trend in the portfolio investment key sectors that they're looking at was power renewal metallurgical real estate and construction services and it they are also looking at some startups and recently in the introduction you had mentioned about dubai uh, the, the world expo uh, has selected a few indian startups to display at uh, the world expo in dubai during the period and i think the startup intervention can actually uh, increase on fuel security we remain uh, a trusted uh, partner and a long term reliable source of food exports to the gulf this relationship can develop uh, by uh, looking at mutual investments although it's become stronger in the past we are looking at specific connectivity uh, establishment of joint joint ventures and not uh, across the value chain but also uh, in uh, back end with the states and the local uh, uh, local bodies in agriculture the first the procurement of fertilizer and raw materials and import from region uh, continues and we need to see how we can look at uh, diversifying this because the number of molecules is pretty limited we need to go beyond uh, that gas is another area we can look in in the future the uh, demand in india is actually uh, increasing uh, during the covid of course both oil and gas prices uh, have uh, bolstered the competitive uh, position of gas and unlocked the uh, purchasing uh, power by you know for more sensitive lng buyers but we need to look at strategic uh, pipelines between uh, the region both india uh, and other countries have been evaluating a number of options for gas supply through transnational gas pipelines uh, many of the transnational pipelines proposed in the past have challenges of security or logistics or economics that have not project uh, you know, progressed much and therefore Uh, there is a need not only as the minister mentioned for defense uh, cooperation we should look at uh, areas of security uh, cooperation where we can make some of these deep water pipelines with the oman to india or the middle east india deep water pipeline which could potentially strengthen and promote commercial and uh, cultural ties between uh, the gulf region and india um in the renewable energy sector we had attracted significant investment uh, over 10 million mandates of employment per annum have been created here it is one sector which has got a lot of foreign direct investment and we have had even sovereign uh, wealth funds invest in this uh, sector there is a need for greater cooperation between center and state to ensure the stability and the continuance of uh, contracts in this region it's uh, very difficult to uh, very easy to say it in a speech but very difficult to actually do it in practice but we all need to work together uh, to enable that uh, to to grow i think different uh, countries in the region uh, have transformed themselves from trading hubs to media entertainment education and tourism centers these services other than it services which have been in the past offer new areas of collaboration uh, going forward and looking at sustainability and commitment to diversity and inclusion uh, in this whole area can be something which both of us could work together indian corporate presence in the in in the region has grown in the traditional centers of construction fmcg it ites banking power but the potential has not been realized uh, whether we look at uh, the healthcare or pharmaceuticals etc as the minister mentioned during the covid uh, crisis the whole area of health and pharmaceutical supplies had a new dimension this could be a, a further area for a strategic partnership amongst the countries in the region and here and you know help building national healthcare systems across uh, uh, the region 
including uh, entrepreneurship and skill development uh, going forward. All medium and small enterprises in India are also looking for new business partnerships around the world. We feel that organizations such as Piki could help uh, matchmaking in this going forward. Uh, I believe that uh, there are a few key elements uh, of the future endeavors, and I'll just end with these four bullet points. We need to expand uh, the, the, the joint ventures and in, in infrastructure and manufacturing. We need to expand tapping of the sovereign wealth funds uh, and integrating them into the supply chain here and also look at the high network individuals and institutions in India, uh, in, 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 in the region. Another focus could be the whole area of innovation and startups. Uh, entrepreneurial collaborations are future-oriented. Uh, I had mentioned these startups that had been taken for the Dubai Expo, whether it's IT, e-commerce, hospitality, logistics, and others. New and emerging technologies, uh, especially in artificial intelligence, virtual intelligence, machine uh, learning, uh, fintech, logistics, edutech, you know, this whole thing of where the beam application was uh, accepted uh, in the UAE, can we look at uh, expanding this uh, cooperation uh, going forward? As the Honorable Minister mentioned, defense and space and defense security are high priority sectors of cooperation where both the Indian private sector and the defense undertakings uh, could play a major role. We need to focus on specialized equipments and processes for exports and, of course, training of launch satellites, sharing of satellite data. The Honorable Minister mentioned that, so I will not uh, repeat that. With both India and the Gulf region engaged in reforms and transformational changes in the economy, uh, the strong potential uh, and political understanding and goodwill between the, peop uh, between the leadership provides an opportunity to build a people-to-people -people connect and raise uh, the economic engagement to a higher level. As I mentioned, we started with trade, oil, and expatriates. We need to move to high network individuals and institutions. We need to see, ensure that existing investments uh, have a stability and growth, so they attract fresh investment. We need to form alliances to address uh, the third country markets. India, like there's a, for example, there's a there's an international mart in in Dubai. We could have an India uh, mart in in Dubai uh, going forward and look at accessing the region and other Africa and other areas. And diversity of engagement, both sectors and beyond diaspora. So we have to move from POE to high network, which is the H, existing investment stability, which is the E, alliances, which is the A, and diversity, which is D. So move from pro to head. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And I'll be there to answer any questions to the leaders. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Lipchinoy, for a uh, very insightful address. Of course, you've identified a lot of sectors, including food security, gas, renewable energy, services, uh, and given uh, a lot of concrete recommendations uh, that we would uh, surely uh, include in, uh, in our outcome uh, from this panel discussion. Uh, so thank you uh, once more uh, from our side. Uh, and of course, uh, please stay back uh, should there be questions uh, that may be addressed to you. Uh, I would now request uh, Mr. Varun Sood. Mr. Deepak Bagla has not been able to join us. Mr. Varun Sood is the Vice President of Invest India. Uh, and uh, from my tenure in Dubai, I know that uh, he also looks uh, acutely at uh, uh, the Gulf region. Uh, he's been a frequent visitor there. Uh, so I would request him uh, to make a few remarks uh, now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Honorable Minister. Secretary MEA, the Joint Secretary Gulf, Indian ambassadors and senior officials from our High Commissions abroad, industry leaders, and distinguished panelists. A very good morning. As uh, Joint Secretary Gulf mentioned, uh, Mr. Bagla unfortunately is unwell. He was looking forward to this particular uh, discussion and the panel. Uh, so I'll be representing Invest India. For those who are not aware, Invest India is a national investment promotion and facilitation agency of the government, which is looking after the Make in India program execution. Uh, one of the key uh, elements that we focus is to bring in more foreign direct investment. And as the Honorable Minister and uh, Secretary General Fekhi had earlier mentioned, there are three and five key pillars which kind of ties up the partnership between Gulf and India. 
uh, according to us, you know, the government to government connect is something which is very critical. And with the uh, relationship that we already share with the Gulf nations, which is strengthening day by day, uh, we can see that effect coming into play. The second important pillar is the people to people connect. Uh, most of these Gulf countries have the highest uh, number of Indian diaspora living in there. And that is something which brings us the cultural aspect and the strong ties within the people in that in those particular countries. And the final element that uh, I wanted to touch upon today is the business to business element. And that is something which is critical. Uh, as we rightly mentioned, the theme of this particular discussion is partnership uh, and investment opportunities and uh, leveraging emerging technologies. So this is the real opportunities for these businesses to come together, collaborate, as the Honorable Minister mentioned, the global partnerships are something which can lead the way to the future as well. So just to give you a quick overview, Invest India currently has been facilitating close to around $21 billion worth of investments from the Gulf nation itself which is uh, estimated to generate close to around 3 lakh plus jobs in the country as well. Uh, some of the key uh, marquee names that we are working in the past and uh, we've been engaged from the Gulf region includes uh, Sipcam, Aramco from Saudi, uh, UAV have been working very closely with DP World, Sharaf, Lulu, uh, MR Group as well, and Oman and Kuwait, we have Bhavan and Al Futah Holdings in Karon Life Sciences. All these companies have some kind of a setup or they're looking at huge potential opportunities into India. And Invest India is there to kind of support and handhold them in understanding the landscape of the market, understanding the regulation, meeting the key stakeholders and ensuring that their projects get grounded uh, immediately as well. The other thing that we wanted to briefly touch upon today is that, uh, you know, with the Honorable PM uh, uh, visiting all these nations, the uh, tie-ups have strengthened in the past. For example, the Saudi, uh, the Honorable Minister mentioned about the investments coming in from their sovereign wealth funds, especially PIF, looking into infrastructure, technology and healthcare investments. Uh, the commitment given by Saudi for $100 billion, our team, we have a special uh, foreign institutional investors team, which have been working very closely with PIF, had multiple round of discussions to understand some of their concerns and how to kind of ensure that this commitment materializes into investments on ground. The other uh, key element is UAE, where a $75 billion investment, uh, uh, you know, commitment has been given by the highest level to the government of India. Again, uh, uh, as uh, the Honorable uh, Joint Secretary Sir mentioned, during his tenure as CG Dubai, we had the opportunity to kind of work very closely under his guidance and the Honorable Ambassador during the High Level Task Forum, where we met all these investors to understand some of the key concerns and what could be done to kind of ensure that there's ease of doing business on the ground and these challenges are uh, an impediment to growth are resolved. So, so that this $75 billion worth of investment flows into the country. Uh, the other key element uh, that's there is that uh, the Invest India, uh, you know, had an opportunity to sign an MOU with the Ministry of Artificial Intelligence in UAE to look at the healthcare sector. I think Mr. Chinoy mentioned that healthcare is one critical area that we need to look at and find new avenues to explore as well. Uh, we do have a lot of interest coming from most of the Gulf nations. For example, from Saudi, we've received around 88 investment interests ranging in the sectors such as food processing, ITBPM, construction and uh, re real retail and tourism. In UAE, the focus has been uh, again on food, construction, retail, tourism and energy. Similarly, we've seen that there are certain critical sectors which have been, uh, you know, very prominent for once these investors are looking to come and enter the Indian market. Uh, talking about the energy theme, uh, you know, uh, nearly 40% of India's crude oil is imported from the Gulf countries itself. And there are a lot of partnerships which are happening in the downstream petrochemical fertilizers and energy initiatives. Uh, the Omni, Omni, Omifeco fertilizer plant in Oman is one good example. The government of Oman has collaborated with Indian company to kind of take it forward. Uh, the, the emerging technologies that we are seeing trend is coming up uh, in the PLI uh, for large-scale electronics manufacturing, the 
phase link uh, incentive plan which the government has launched and especially in the 10 key sectors that they're focusing on there's a huge opportunity for these investors to come and manufacture in india and then not only export to gcc but to africa and other parts of the world as well uh, we're also looking at leveraging the data center policy 2020 uh, the national strategy on artificial intelligence uh, the national strategy on blockchain to understand how we can bring in those investments into the country as well uh, in my closing uh, remarks, I just want to uh, touch upon the recent, uh, you know, UNCTAD, which is the agency appointed by UN, uh, looking after more than 180 nations and covering their investment promotion agency. And West India has been awarded the best IPA agency for 2020 uh, to the kind of response we had for our during the COVID pandemic situation. The business immunity platform, the uh, the impact that we had on not only the businesses, but uh, the life of a common citizen was actually, uh, you know, appreciated at the highest level. And going by the PM's, the Honorable Prime Minister's vision on ease of living and ease of doing business, uh, which is bringing the excellent in, excellence into the government. We believe this uh, award is a big testimonial to the changes that are happening on the ground. And uh, we'll be there, Invest India is there to support the investors and work very closely with our missions and partners in ensuring that these investments get grounded in India as soon as possible. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you, uh, Varun. Uh, of course, Invest India has been doing a wonderful job in terms of hand-holding uh, the uh, concerns of uh, investors from various Gulf countries as well as from other countries. And uh, I would like to thank uh, you for uh, for your uh, work on this as well. Uh, of course, uh, you know uh, you've gone into various areas in which investments can further come. Uh, from Gulf countries, and that will be uh, that's been very useful. Uh, we would now uh, move uh, to our panelists, uh, who are very eminent and who've joined us from various Gulf countries. Uh, the first, and we are going uh, alphabetical in terms of countries. Uh, so, uh, the first one is uh, Mr. Mohammed Dadabhai, chairman of Dadabhai Group, one of the most distinguished uh, uh, Indians, uh, shall I call, uh, but he's a Bahraini national, he's been the chairman of Dadabhai Group, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, Kingdom of Bahrain's most acclaimed uh, business conglomerates. Uh, he's been former member of the Shura Council, uh, but remains uh, very engaged with the Indian community. Uh, and I would uh, uh, request him to make uh, uh, his remarks uh, in this panel discussion. Good morning, sir. It's uh, first of all, I would like to thank Honorable Minister uh, Mr. Mulidharan for uh, giving me an opportunity to be a part of this discussion. Uh, yes, I am very proud that I am a Bahraini but of Indian origin. And that helps me a lot when it comes to the relation between Bahrain and Gulf, in, Bahrain and India, and Gulf also because. As a Bahraini national, we have an excess of same opportunities in the whole of Gulf. I must tell you, sir, that uh, all uh, your, uh, your Excellency, the Minister knows that Bahrain is the most tolerant place. Uh, Honorable Prime Minister visited uh, last year and he inaugurated a temp uh, extension of a temple which is 200 years old. We have got uh, Senegal for the Jews and it goes on. The country has got a freedom of religion which attracts people for investment to come as well as they are always keen to do business and relationship with India because half of the population of Bahrain are Indians. And as I said earlier in one of my interactions lecture that every Bahraini family has got an Indian. It starts from his kitchen to his car, to his accounts, and it goes on. So India and Bahrain have that strong relations which Bahrain doesn't have with any country. In the pretext of that, the things as Bahrain is changing now, the new, the new our, our Prime Minister, uh, Sheikh Salman, who is now just taken over because of, uh, of the, of, uh, we, we have, uh, we lost our, Prime Minister, he is a very, very visionary man, and he has a great bond with India. He has gone 
particularly after the, uh, he's gone to Kerala when I was with him and his, his, his Majesty the King came to India. So the relation, the bond of relation between coming back to the point is always very strong. And in the pretext of that, people like us, we always make a bridge to get more and more opportunities for both the Indian companies and both the Bahraini companies, how they can move forward with the time in the terms of such growing <coughs> economic, which we require. Unfortunately, it has been because of this COVID, things have slowed down. But I can see that India, Bahrain today needs a lot of solar energy joint ventures. We have, we have sun, we have a very good weather, and equally, we, there is another sector which is very important, which Bahrain is looking forward for, is the pharma sector. So these two sectors, even from our side, are looking forward, and they want, their first priority is India. And, and I think through this, uh, uh, my participation, I would like to pass on this message to all the seniors, gentlemen who are from FIKI and other related uh, organizations and Honorable Minister also is here, that Bahrain is open in the terms of full participation. You don't require any local participations and they support you as much as they support. So an opportunity for the Indian uh, uh, entrepreneurs are always there. Coming back to Bahrain is looking forward to go to India, yes. But as we all know that we, we don't have that huge financial resources like other Gulf countries has. But nevertheless, the Bahrainis are very well, highly educated community. They always look forward of creating uh, where the, 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 the organizations of two countries, how they can grow. So I personally, is my feeling that this is an opportunity to see that the sectors, which I said, like pharma and solar, of course, these are the two sectors. Again, coming back to education, we are, we are recently have uh, started a very high-end school. And this is also a very important sector for Bahrain because they need the community to grow more in the terms of education. Also, there are areas like IT technology and all, which Bahrain needs complete support of India. And I think that with, at the moment we have got, uh, there are organizations in Bahrain like Lulu and uh, there are a few of them. Shapurji Palanji is building the biggest mall in Bahrain, which is bigger than the Dubai mall. And there are areas where the Indian uh, entrepreneurs can always come and see the opportunities available in Bahrain. Our sector, we are in construction and development, and also we are also have a very prominent travel. We have got about 17 branches, and uh, my, our other my travels was involved recently in the repatriation of uh, so many of in Indians. So we, we created about 200 flights, and uh, they, they, have, uh, they have been doing an excellent job in co coordination with the embassies all around in the Gulf. And these are the sectors I can see that uh, the entrepreneurs from India and institutions from India can look into Bahrain, and Bahrain and India can build up a strong ties in all these sectors. I, whenever I get an opportunity, I always bring to the attention that, of course, there are Dubai and all these places, but what, what Bahrain has got an opportunity is, again, it is connected with Saudi Arabia. In, in 20 minutes, you are in Saudi Arabia, and the frequency between the bridge. So most of the uh, other organizations from other world, they have their base offices in Bahrain. And similarly, yes, there are Indian institutions have started that, but in the pretext of this opportunity which I got, I would like to mention that Kuwait, Saudi Arabia are all connected with roads. Kuwait is about three hours by road, Saudi Arabia, as I said, so Bahrain is the center of all these activities for Indian institutions. And I think that uh, my feeling is that with the time to come, and yes, uh, lately when uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi came to Bahrain, 
it was again where we developed our relations. We had Foreign Minister Mr. Jay Shankar was here last week. So these relations are increasing. And in the pretext of this, of course, ultimately we can say that how the Indian institutions can base here and work side by side, of course, opportunities which uh, Honorable Minister said for India, people definitely here look into it. And we also have our government financial institutions and they and on that level, that is a different level of how to participate. But I'm coming back to the entrepreneurs level, which we are, that there is a lot of opportunity which can be looked into Bahrain. And uh, I think uh, I'm again thankful to all of uh, Honorable Minister, our ambassador in Bahrain, Mr. Piyush, and uh, I personally feel that we look forward again to discuss on these things. That, you know, on a personal note, I can tell you that I am being a Bahraini of an Indian origin. My services are always there whenever I am there, and I must uh, say that, inshallah, hopefully, we, 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 this relation has been very good in the past, and now, and it will grow in future. On this note, I thank once again all of you. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Dadabhai. Uh, and uh, please keep uh, the Indian and the Bahraini flag uh, flying high in, uh, in Bahrain. Uh, of course, you mentioned about uh, Honorable Foreign Ministers, Honorable External Affairs Ministers' visit uh, to Bahrain recently. And I was uh, part of that visit and uh, the warmth with which he was uh, received uh, by uh, the leadership of the country uh, augurs very well for our uh, future collaboration. Of course, we have historic relations and you've identified a few sectors such as solar, pharma, education and entrepreneurship uh, in which uh, uh, people from the two countries can work together. Uh, thank you very much. And now uh, we would move uh, to Mr. Samir Ketkar, who is Senior Associate uh, with Worldly Advisory in Oman. Uh, he is a strategy practitioner uh, with financial advisory experience. Uh, and continues to engage in consulting, consulting and leadership roles. Uh, and uh, he has a, a, a very deep background on, on various issues uh, related to business uh, and related to India-Oman relations. Uh, so I would uh, give the floor to him now uh, to make his remarks. Thank you, sir. Namaste all. Uh, all the eminent panelists as well as uh, heads of missions. Uh, Thank you for having me. Uh, this is Samir from Muscat. Uh, my topic today is uh, is is on oil and uh, why we need to still uh, look back at oil uh, as uh, main contributor to uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, vision. So, in a sense, uh, oil has been changing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what is what has been happening is uh, oil has not uh, remained uh, so easy to extract and uh, it has it has now uh, emerged into a second domain uh, where uh, the enhanced oil recoveries uh, are now the need of the hour so if you see oman uh, and its oil reserves uh, it essentially has uh, these technologies as a prerequisite uh, for many of their reservoirs and the need is growing. The technologies uh, can, be, uh, can be brought in by Indian businessmen, uh, but essentially our presence is limited. That is the start uh, mooting, mood point, uh, basically why uh, we have to little look back at uh, what we are doing in this oil and gas sector. So at the start, I must declare that uh, I'm not representing uh, my company here. Uh, I've come here uh, to, uh, to the panel discussion on the basis that uh, we remain as Indian diaspora uh, a contributor to Indian economy in one way or the other. And uh, we uh, have a moral uh, obligation of uh, protecting India's interests uh, wherever we go. So uh, with that basis and uh, being an engineer, so uh, expect uh, uh, expect some technical and implementation kind of a skew in my presentation. Presentation is very brief, uh, four or five slides uh, to cover uh, my six minutes of uh, presentation. Uh, so in a sense, uh, 
if we look at uh, countries' budgets, uh, and Oman is a good example of that, we are trying to diverse here beyond oil and gas, uh, but currently we remain 70% uh, dependent uh, as a oil and gas being a main revenue getter. So uh, investments are required in this sector uh, and uh, to sustain oil productions, uh, that is going to be very important uh, going forward. Uh, so Oman's upstream play uh, is basically uh, kind of a beacon light for uh, GCC, uh, how the things will grow here. So enhanced oil recovery technologies uh, are are essentially required. Oil and gas play needs some serious investments. This space has been uh, dominated by uh, Western uh, or uh, classical oil and gas uh, players, uh, be it international oil companies or national oil companies having their stake. Uh, now, what is happening is uh, on the technological entry point, uh, we see uh, that uh, Indian investors uh, have uh, started taking uh, stakes in oil and gas and uh, some blocks are also being open. Uh, energy security for Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, vision uh, of India is very important. Uh, as we grow, as we become a $5 trillion economy, uh, our needs will be enormous as well. So uh, our focus uh, to sustain on hydrocarbon production levels uh, require leaner operations here. And this is where uh, we can contribute. Uh, we, the Gulf is moving uh, towards uh, low price of oil uh, as, as far as the production cost is concerned because there are uh, there are pressures on the oil price and uh, oil price is remaining range bound uh, and low as well uh, to moderate yeah so more streamlined corporate structures and uh, budgets for astute uh, financial arrangements to sustain leaning of the upstream businesses is required Oman uh, is investing in these technologies firsthand. Yeah, uh, so uh, the oil sands in Canada or heavy oils in uh, America, uh, such as uh, Texas and uh, California, uh, those are being implemented here. And for last fifteen years, uh, this has been the focus, and it has show, started showing uh, quite good results. And this contributes. Uh, Oil exports. So the oil uh, which has which has been uh, exported, uh, say 15, 20 years before, uh, had changed its uh, dimension. Yeah, it has. Uh, it is not flowing uh, naturally. It needs uh, these technologies: thermal injections, steam injections, chemical injections, gas injection to bring out oil. And uh, at the same time. The companies are looking at uh, farming out uh, certain blocks and uh, also they are attracting uh, investments. So uh, they are creating contracting strategies such as fully owned operations, uh, de-boom type contracts, uh, lease licenses. Yes, we, we know that there are entry barriers, but uh, for India uh, and the Gulf, uh, we have special relations. Oman India relations also are uh, centuries old, uh, and we need to take advantage. Uh, our people are uh, predominantly seen in these sectors, but our companies uh, do lag uh, in their investments. So we have opportunity there uh, because sooner or the later, uh, these things will will become important. I'll quickly scan through these three. Uh, focus areas, chemical AOR requires certain uh, technologies and certain equipments. And if we look at India's uh, technological foray, we should not be behind on these. These are, uh, these are pretty uh, good technologies to invest in. We already have these uh, in different downstream and different industrial sectors. So, we need to bring it together, say water treatments, oil treatments, uh, uh, disposals, uh, gas exports, uh, things like that. 
uh, thermal also we need steam generators uh, water treatments uh, and similar technologies so you see that uh, th this is nothing new for india uh, this is pretty uh, pretty uh, straightforward uh, looking investment area the entry point uh, is is very important and uh, we need to invest because this this requires serious investment self reliant india's dreams can't be realized i feel uh, without de risking hydrocarbon imports and eor investments can enable a vantage point because what is happening in oman currently would happen in other gulf nations and uh, we would need imported oil uh for our sustained uh, 5 trillion dollar economy and to get there so higher oil prices uh are, are not currently uh, prevalent so the pressure on costing is is there so these portfolio techniques uh, can bring these oman gcc relationship uh, to a investor uh, relationship more than consumer supplier as mentioned by a few eminent uh, panelists before uh, so i would plead that uh, we we should make use of current situations that there is upskilling requirements localization efforts in in oman and also in gcc so we should uh, take part there with our knowledge economy and uh, having a holistic perspective uh, and looking at icv in positivity uh, aggressive investment mechanisms are being looked at uh, which i've just explained with the ownerships and uh, project delivery contracts stakes in the oil blocks yeah uh, so with this i come to uh, my end of presentation and further discussion and further q and a is welcome on this front uh, jahin thank you thanks for having me Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Samir Kethkar, and thank you for reminding uh, the continued importance of oil uh, in our developmental uh, needs and how uh, we can use our knowledge-based economy uh, and uh, and go beyond uh, the kind of uh, what we say as buyer-seller relationship on the oil side uh, with the Gulf countries. So, thank you uh, once again. Uh, I would now like to invite Mr. Pradeep Panda, who is the General Manager and Head of Foreign Corporate uh, at National Bank of Kuwait, uh, for uh, for his presentation and comments. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, Honorable Minister of uh, State, Mr. Murali Dharan, uh, Senior Officials of uh, Ministry of External Affairs, uh, Ambassadors, Indian Ambassadors in the region, fellow panelists and speakers. A very good morning to all of you from Kuwait. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Pradeep Handa. I'm part of the executive management of National Bank of Kuwait. And also I head uh, one of the business groups as general manager. My presentation on the topic under discussion today is uh, from a Kuwaiti perspective. So let me just uh, upload my presentation. Um, okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to start uh, with some high level facts uh, about Kuwait, uh, which has relevance to India. Uh, to start with, the total population of Kuwait is 4.5 million, out of which Kuwaitis constitute 1.4 million, which is about 31% of the total population, and Indians 1.1 million, which is about 24% of the total populations. Indians are the largest uh, foreign community in Kuwait. Now, Indian workforce remits approximately US dollars $4.5 billion annually to India. Again, uh, Kuwait is uh, very much dependent on oil. The current crude production amounts to approximately 2.3 million barrels, 
per day, out of which 315,000 315, barrels a day is exported to India, which amounts to almost 13 to 14% of Kuwait's total crude production. It is, Kuwait is the 10th largest supplier of crude to India and meets almost 4% of India's overall energy needs. The bilateral trade between India and Kuwait comes to around 10.8 billion, out of which imports to Kuwait are around 1.3 billion and exports from Kuwait, predominantly oil, 9.5 billion. The known oil reserves of Kuwait are about 102 billion barrels and at current rate of production, they can last well over 100 years for Kuwait. Kuwait ranks sixth among the countries with largest oil reserves in the world and it is OPEC's third largest producer. Now, the relationship between India and Kuwait has been very historical. There were strong maritime and cultural links during the pre-oil era. India was a natural trading partner of Kuwait at that time. Uh, you know, uh, in, uh, Kuwait was exporting dates and pearls to India and in turn importing cereals, clothes and spices. Also a very important factor, Indian rupee was a legal tender in Kuwait till 1961. And this is when Kuwait gets an independence from the British rule that the Kuwaiti dinar was introduced at that point. The National Bank of Kuwait was the first local bank to be established, and it was the first joint stock company to be established in the whole of the region. And as you notice uh, on the right side of the slide, the first balance sheet of NBK, which was in 1953, is denominated in Indian rupees, and right up to 61, all our balance sheets were in Indian rupees. The, the topic of discussion today focuses on energy partnerships, investment opportunities, and technologies. And I think the best way to tackle this is to look at synergies between Kuwait and India in these areas and also the way forward. Talking first of energy partnerships, Kuwait has an economy which is highly dependent on oil. 95% of the state revenues are generated from oil. Therefore, the need is to continue producing, selling, and generating revenue from oil. And in order to achieve that, the strategy of the state is to seek as much as possible sustainable, long-term outlets of Kuwaiti crude in overseas markets, and for which they are looking at building partnerships, particularly in the downstream area. And these include areas like refining, retail distribution, and petrochemicals or even strategic storage facilities. Now, how does India fit into this equation? India is obviously looking for energy security. Therefore, India is a good match for what Kuwait is targeting, obviously. Kuwait Petroleum Corporation, which is the state-owned top oil holding company of the country, has been trying for many years to get a foothold in India. And if my memory serves me right, going back to 1990s, they were even looking at investments in refineries coming up in Panipat and Mathura at that stage. Unfortunately, they have not been very successful or successful at all, to be, to be putting it bluntly. And when we talk to them, they say that it is very challenging when it comes to India, even though they have already done a few investments on the downstream side in other countries in the world. Among other things, they say that it is difficult to deal with the bureaucracy. There's a lack of transparency in what they are getting into. And they look for incentives, which they say lack when they go to India. We look at the investments now. We talked about uh, sovereign wealth funds and Honorable Minister also mentioned sovereign wealth funds. Kuwait has one of the oldest and largest sovereign wealth funds in the world. 
It is managed by Kuwait Investment Authority, which is an arm of the Ministry of Finance in Kuwait. And currently, it manages a portfolio of over 600 billion US dollars. Now, most of these investments are earmarked for future generations. So obviously, the objective is very clear that they would like to have them as secure and stable as possible and with a decent return on capital. But when we look on the other side, India, current investments in India by KIA are a mere $5 billion, out of which $2 billion came in recent years only. And I think we need to seriously work in this area. And we believe that there is very good potential to grow when it comes to attracting foreign, uh, attracting sovereign wealth fund. The third aspect deals with technology and development. And again, when we look at Kuwait, the Kuwait's 2035 vision is to transform Kuwait into a major regional leading financial and commercial hub. The intention is to take advantage of its strategic geographical location, besides being very well connected with the Gulf countries. It is connected to Iraq with common borders, and through that to countries in the Levant and CIS countries as well. Unlike some of the other countries in the region, it has a democratic system of government, and it has one of the oldest judicial systems, very fairly comprehensive, and a very balanced foreign policy. The population is very young, and it needs facilities like education. There's a need for healthcare facilities, creation of jobs, new townships, like housing facilities, etc., are the need. It is looking, therefore, to engage with private sector, not necessarily Kuwait, but across the world, and form partnerships. And needless to say, the focus and very strong focus is also on technology and digitalization. Now, on the flip side, when we look at India, Indian manpower is in the forefront, helping all these developments. But when we look at whether the manpower is being matched by companies or corporations who can provide comprehensive solutions for the development, and also, equally important, the ability to compete with other global companies or corporations, there is very little available. Unfortunately, when we look at uh, the landscape, the business landscape, other than Larson and Tubra, when we talk about major comprehensive solution providers, there is very little available when it comes to India. Key takeaways, therefore, in my opinion, are that while we have lots of opportunities in Kuwait and vice versa, for mutual benefit, we need to first and foremost, and on a fast track basis, work in India as well in areas like infrastructure development, industrial development, education reform, social reforms, building world-class corporations, and take care of our red tape bureaucracy and be transparent. And I believe that this will automatically lead to greater potential across the board and ultimately to our goal, which is Atam Nirbhar Bharat. And with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Pradeep Handa, uh, for your uh, presentation and uh, uh, reminding us of the historic relations uh, between India and the Gulf. I think uh, this is one of the biggest strengths uh, that is there between India and the Gulf countries, and that is uh, to be continuously built upon. Uh, you've also presented uh, a framework of how to think about the issue uh, by developing synergies uh, between uh, India and Kuwait or India and the Gulf countries, uh, thinking each issue uh, uh, separately. Uh, and of course, you have uh, made some suggestions, including on uh, reducing red tape, uh, bureaucracy, 
uh, and uh, I can say uh, that that is reflected, uh, I think, in the uh, strides that we have made uh, on the ease of doing business. Uh, I think everyone uh, knows about it under the uh, leadership of Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji. Uh, I would now uh, give the floor to Mr. Nishad Azim, who is the CEO of uh, Coastal Qatar. Uh, he has over 20 years of uh, professional experience in construction industry, uh, oil and gas, uh, and uh, has also created several uh, joint ventures. Uh, they call their company Coastal Qatar uh, as the challenge engineers, uh, and uh, I think uh, that's a fantastic word uh, that they have uh, coined. Uh, uh, I think they're also involved in some ways uh, with the FIFA World Cup. I was going through their website, uh, and uh, without saying much further, uh, let me uh, give the floor to him uh, to make his uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, um, Honorable Minister, Mr. Mulidran. Uh, heads of mission, members of uh, Pravasi Bharat, and uh, distinguished panelists. It's indeed a pleasure to be part of this panel discussion. And uh, I would be my, my presentation would be on, on two parts. Uh, one would be on the partnership section, and the other would be on the investment part. And and as as you know, we, we have the reason I want to spend more time on the investment part is because I think that's an area where we need to have more clarity and, and there's not enough content on the how part. There is a lot of what, what we need to do, but how do we do that? That's where I think we need to, uh, to look at more closely. So if you would let me share my presentation real quickly. So as we said, we're talking about uh, the, the, uh, the, the leveraging of energy partnership and investment uh, opportunities. And uh, as like the moderator said, you know, we are a, a company called Coastal Qatar. We are manufacturing the stadium seats for six of the seven stadiums in Qatar, which is locally manufactured with a technology partnership uh, with a foreign company. So we are into manufacturing, construction, healthcare, and trading. So going to the leveraging of the energy partnership real quickly, as we know, India is the largest consumer of one of the largest consumer of energy in the world, and we're moving towards a gas-based economy and, and to planning to have about 15% of our energy coming from uh, gas. On the other hand, Qatar is the largest producer of natural gas in the world, and we have a project called Northfield Expansion Project, which is ongoing right now, which with which the capacity would be increased from 77 million tons per annum to 110 in phase one, and then we'll go on to 126 million uh, tons per annum in phase two. So as you can see, there is a uh, sort of a supply demand. There is an increase in supply or production from Qatar, and then we're forecasting an increase in demand uh, from India. So that opens up a lot of opportunities for partnership and synergies. One could be to build, you know, the infrastructure. You know, as we know, when we transport uh, liquefied natural gas, it needs to be uh, frozen, and then it needs to be sort of uh, regasified. So that's a huge infrastructure investment, which uh, Qatar could be a potential partner in that. The other opportunity could be for the 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 expanding the national gas pipeline grid to the different corners of the country. And also the network within the cities, which would make a gas more accessible to the general public in a more efficient and an economical way. So this sort of allows for Qatar to sort of increase the, the demand for the particular product. And, and this uh, can sort of have a better opportunity for partnership. Another one area where India could contribute is to be a regional hub for the distribution of gas. Because of a geographical positioning, uh, we are well poised to distribute uh, gas to neighboring countries like Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, uh, and, and Sri Lanka, and more so to the landlocked countries like Nepal and Bhutan. And I would think that a connection or a, a route, land route, would be more economical than a sea route to countries like Bangladesh. So there exists a lot of uh, opportunities uh, on, on that front. And also, in terms of the emerging technologies, uh, there is a lot of opportunities coming up related to World Cup. Uh, it could be even in terms of accommodation, ticketing, booking, those sort of different areas uh, where India, Indian companies could look into as opportunities in Qatar. And we are actually currently looking at uh, um, a team which would be focusing on this uh, element. Now, going on to the next section of my of my presentation, which is on uh, investment uh, for Atmanirbhar India. 
And this is more of a case study because we as Coastal Qatar, we have an ongoing project in India uh, which comes under Atanirpur. And it is relatively, uh, uh, you know, geared towards uh, being India being more self-reliant in certain product. And as you know, I would like to, uh, you know, borrow from Steve Jobs, what he said is, you know, ideas are worth nothing uh, if not unless executed. And that's where I think we need to have more emphasis as, as, uh, as you know, um, as uh, Indian or government agencies to support more investment to come into India. So I think we are all familiar with the the five pillars of uh, Atmanirbhar, and I would more stress more on on the infrastructure, which where I think we have a huge deficit, and it should form the backbone of any economy. And I think there's huge opportunities there. Another one also in terms of our a customer base. I think India has a huge customer base, which has not been exactly leveraged or exploited to its full extent. And in any situation, when you are looking at a self-reliant uh, or to promote self-reliancy, the first thing you would look at, what are you not self-reliant on? And if you look at the imports uh, uh, in 2019 for India, top 15, that could be a starting point. And you'll see a huge variance in the, uh, in the type of uh, products that we import. For example, oil is almost three times uh, what we are importing in terms of the second one, which is which is gold. So any small dent in that area would contribute to a huge, uh, huge, uh, you know, uh, self-reliancy. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in terms of replacing oil. It could be a substitute for oil. So in terms of renewable energy or any other uh, form which will reduce the consumption of oil. Another one, if you look at item number 14, nitrogenous fertilizer, we have 117% increase uh, in that. So this could be a starting point for us to look at, you know, why are we, how, what can we do to reduce the reliance on these imports uh, to, to our country. And for us, when we were looking at the project, the key consideration that we had or the key parameters we looked at were one, of course, you know, this product has to be imported in substantial quantities. We needed to have critical mass to allow for a, uh, economies of scale uh, in, in terms of production. The other one was greater time of horizon. If anyone wants to inter invest in a product or start manufacturing a product, you need to look at the demand. Is it going to? Is it a periodic demand? Is it going to be a long-term demand, or is the demand going to increase? And for our product, we found that there's going to be an increased demand for this particular product. And we wanted to convert uh, with our project from India being an importer of this product to an exporter. So that was another consideration. We looked at the demand globally in the neighboring countries and, and across the globe in, in terms of what is the demand of this product. And since we're looking at also export, the, the, the standards of the product has to be global. And since we are not manufacturing it locally, then that means we don't have the know-how or the technology, excuse me, uh, for this production. So we are able to find a, a company which is a global leader in this product to work with us on this project. And then, of course, the, the standard uh, requirements in terms of raw material, skill, manpower, and infrastructure was another consideration. Financing options, debt equity, cost of capital, all this is another consideration which you would need to look into. And another very important part, especially for people who are sitting in this part of the world is on, on clarity on the regulation and the, and the permits and controls that, uh, that are there uh, in, in back in India. So this is another area where I think investors should need to spend substantial time to understand. And another one which I borrowed from one of the other presenters uh, I saw is Roti, you know, which, is, which calls for a return on time invested. This is another consideration if you are looking at investing or making a project in India versus other parts of the world, what would be your return on your time invested? Because that's another resource that any investor would like to look into. What went well, we had really a good team uh, from the Qatar uh, ambassador support and also the embassy team who are really uh, proactive and supportive. And they in turn introduces us to the Invest India team. And uh, I was in touch with uh, Warun Sood and, uh, and I'm, I'm really amazed and really uh, thankful for their you know, continued support and their enthusiasm and uh, their zest for you know, bringing more investment into India. Uh, we had a few parks that we looked at um, with the up to standard, uh, to international standards. Uh, we had some challenges in the land size because we had a long process line and it wasn't uh, similar to these uh, the standard plots that were available. And we had the support from the local team to, to get those land for us. 
and uh, the, 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 the location was pretty good, good connectivity, good roads, which helped us. And this is what, uh, you know, went well. But at the same time, like I said, you know, we need to look in more closely in terms of the house. You know, we have good ideas, we have good concepts, but unless we are able to execute them efficiently, it may not attract the right kind of investments that you need. So I have a few suggestions which I'd like to put forward to the, to the team uh, for consideration. And these are coming from our personal experience on what uh, we went through. And this is something that would be really valuable if it is taken uh, to heart uh, for the future investors. One is, you know, all the projects are considered similar. So if you have a project that is of strategic importance that comes under Atmanirbhar, you know, we should have a system to identify that this is a project that it can be categorized as an Atmanirbhar project. Once that is done, you could fast track the project with clear deadlines and, and closing dates uh, at each stage. So this would make it much faster for investors to come in and pick these projects and make it more uh, viable or attractive to the investors. Uh, like I said, the investment in the team was exceptionally good, um, but there's a disconnect with the state team. So if you had, and we had to go back and forth many times between the state and the invest in their team. So if you had a liaison office or, a, or a, uh, someone present in the state level who could pick up our project and push it across, that would be a really good uh, opportunity. And a, a clear roadmap in terms of what you need to do when and, and when uh, things will happen. For example, as investors, we have capital invested. Uh, we need to tell our suppliers when we'll be able to get the projects on track and when the product production can start. And, and we are not able to do that. And that's because we don't have clarity on, on what how long it takes at each stage. So if you have an online portal where you could track your progress of your project in terms of where your project is, when you could expect a, a reply or an approval, or what is required you know, to, to, to give you the approval, that would be very uh, useful. And also you could have a chronological uh, you know, detail of events on when it happened. So there is traceability on, on, the, on the performance of each uh, division or each individual. And also if you could have a system of to escalate the process to the next level in case there is a delay or an issue, that would also be very useful for, uh, for the investor. Build investor confidence. As you say, you know, put to your mouth where your money is. If you tell your investors that if there is a delay from outside, we will compensate you, that builds confidence, that you know, tells the investor that the government is serious about bringing in foreign investors to come into the country. So we would appreciate something like that if, if you're able to do. Tax, I think there is a lot of uh, benefits that have come across. Uh, one area I would say is that the GST, because we normally have to pay the GST before we get our money from the suppliers because of the you know, credit terms that was applied, but not a major issue. And last important thing, you know, return on time invested or ROTI. Uh, like we said, you know, I've been there many, many times. Um, and, and every time we are told that things would happen at a particular pace. But unfortunately, I think we, we could really uh, use as investors a better return on the, on the effort that we put in. And uh, that would really give more confidence to more investors to come forward and promote our country to become more self-reliant. And not only self-reliant, but also to be a major exporter, because I truly believe there is a huge potential for India uh, to be a global uh, leader uh, in, in terms of export and bringing our economy forth uh, into a much greater height. And unless we focus on the how and not just the what, I don't think that we will reach there in the speed that we would like to reach there. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of you for having me, and I'd be happy to... Uh, share any or answer any questions that you have on, on, on this particular topic. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Nishad Azim, uh, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I think uh, there are lots of points that you've mentioned. Many of those uh, relate to uh, Invest India, the work that they have been doing. Uh, and I would request Varun uh, to be ready uh, to answer some of the uh, suggestions and questions that have been mentioned uh, in your presentation, uh, especially uh, one uh, wherein you have mentioned about the disconnect uh, with the state governments uh, and whether uh, Invest India, how they are uh, doing the handholding on, on that particular aspect. Uh, I would also uh, request you, Mr. Nishad Azim, uh, once we have finished the presentations, uh, 
uh, to dwell a little bit upon how uh, more Indian companies can leverage any opportunities that FIFA might provide, which is one point uh, that uh, that you mentioned in in, in your presentation. Uh, from our side, of course, uh, you know you you've mentioned about compensation from government agencies for delays. Uh, I can say that uh, definitely automatic approvals is something that uh, that many state governments and central government for for approvals uh, is something that uh, that has been in the pipeline. Many states have done these reforms, uh, and hopefully we will continue uh, to go forward uh, on that path so that uh, your uh, your roti uh, is maximized to the extent uh, possible. Uh, I would uh, now uh, request Mr. Vikas Handa. Uh, who is manager with uh, Gulf Tech uh, Arabia uh, to make uh, his presentation and remarks. Because you're on mute. Sorry. Can you hear now? Am I audible? Yes. Thank you, Vipul. Good morning, ladies, gentlemen, honorable minister, and dignitaries. My name is Vikas Handa. I'm founder and managing director of Gulf Tech Arabia. We manufacture oil and gas equipment in Saudi Arabia. I've spent last 25 years in Middle East and Europe in setting up various companies in manufacturing sector. The reason we chose to set up manufacturing in Saudi Arabia was simple. It was due to the fact that Aramco has a fantastic local manufacturing program called Activa, wherein they enforce their contractors and service companies to buy locally manufactured products. So when, for example, say ArcelorMittal sets up a steel mill in Saudi, offtake off is near guaranteed. That's how um, you know the countries in GCC are attracting um, the international manufacturers um, and world leaders to come and set up manufacturing in country. Saudi Arabia, for example, has been able to grow their non-oil sector GDP at faster rate than the oil sector GDP. And that's only by focusing on their in-country manufacturing program. To the extent that now they are rolling it out to other sectors like mining and healthcare. They're, they are the most populated country in GCC. So they are now asking global healthcare equipment suppliers to manufacture equipment locally. Other countries in GCC are also following suit like UAE and Oman. They have come up with their own in-country value programs. Like us, they have many challenges as well. They have infrastructure, but untrained workforce. So we Indians actually do the job and fill the gap. On the other hand, we have trained workforce and developing infrastructure. They are not democracies. They don't have opposition. We are democracies. We have opposition. Uh, in nutshell, what GCC countries are doing is leveraging their buying power to target global technology leaders to ensure that they come and set up their manufacturing globally. This not only helps them to grow non-oil sector, but elevates their country's technological competencies. So if ONGC gets a concession in GCC, like uh, the minister talked about Abu Dhabi, Zakum field, they have to follow suit and they have to ensure that they purchase locally produced products. However, they don't do it in India because our policies are not yet able to enforce that. One of the reason is that we don't have the best of the global product leaders manufacturing quality products in India. And the domestic manufacturers have not caught up yet. So in, in my experience and in my humble opinion, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I've said on various boards of globally renowned manufacturers, and I can say that they'll be happy to set up locally uh, manufacturing products in India 
if and only if our policies make it prerequisite for them. So we need to do a bit of um, uh, whether you call it dangle a carrot or cajole them. But we've got an enormous market which is very attractive for global manufacturers. So in order to summarize, good news is that we have one of the largest market, large reserves of natural resources and talent base in India. We need to leverage that, what we have, in addition to leveraging our energy partnership with GCC. Under the patronage of Ambassador Osaf Ahmed, uh, we have a very active and thriving Saudi India business network here locally, which can own, not only help to attract global manufacturers to set up manufacturing bases in India, but also help Indian companies to gain foothold and market share in GCC and make Bharat Atmanirbhar to exporting Bharat. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Vikas Handa, for, uh, for your presentation. Uh, I would now request uh, Mr. Sridhar uh, Ayangar, uh, CFO, uh, Aerospace, Renewables, and ICT of Mubadala Investment Company. Uh, of course, it's, it's one of the uh, largest uh, sovereign wealth funds. Uh, and uh, having known Sridhar a little bit uh, during my posting in, uh, uh, in Dubai, I think... Uh, there are lots and lots of things that India and uh, and the sovereign wealth funds in uh, in Abu Dhabi are doing. Uh, so it will be very interesting to uh, listen to his perspective on how uh, we can uh, take the help uh, and work together uh, in the vision of Atmanirbha Bharat uh, going forward. Sridhar. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ripple. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay. Thank you so much, Vipul, and uh, great to connect in your new role, in fact. Uh, Honorable, Honorable Minister of State, Sri Murli Dharan, respected Indian ambassadors to the Gulf regions, distinguished panelists, and uh, a very good morning, in fact, to everyone. Hope you and your families are safe and healthy. I take this opportunity to thank Ambassador Pavan Kapoor and the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present Mubadla, and present our views. Today, I'll be talking to you about the fantastic bilateral relationship that India and UAE have shared over a long time. And more specifically, I'll walk you through Mubadla's vision and our investment journey. Firstly, let me give you a little bit of background as Vipul said about Mubadla. Once again, I'm having a little bit of problems on the, on the, on the presentation. Let me just Yeah. So coming back, in fact, Mubadla is a key participant and the primary public vehicle in Abu Dhabi's strategy to diversify its economy and implementing Abu Dhabi's economic vision 2030. Mubadla's rating and outlook are aligned with those of the government of Abu Dhabi. Uh, uh, it's a double A two stable according to Moody's and double A as per standards and poor. One of our core values is partnership. We strongly believe that together we achieve more. The ethos of partnership has always been at the heart of Mubadla's approach. Our investment philosophy centers on the founding, nurturing, and cementing of these partnerships that we build across the world, whether it is at the government-to-government -government level or at a company-to-company -company level. A Mubadla is amongst the largest state-owned investment funds in the world, with more than dirhams $853 billion, or just over $232 billion in assets under management. So if you see the map, in fact, in front of you, we invest across asset classes, across all asset classes to generate sustainable risk-adjusted returns. We have investments in businesses in more than 50 countries and seven international offices outside of UAE. Our portfolio can be classified as 40% in fund investments, 32% in direct investments, and 38% in investments in the UAE. As explained earlier, Mubadla's investment philosophy is centered on founding of world-class partnerships.
So let me let me zoom out and explain a bit about UAE's relationships with India before before zooming in on Mubadala's vision and investment journey within India. The the UAE's deep as well as strong relationship with India is well known. Generations of Indians have lived here in the UAE, grown businesses. as well as build their professional careers my own story goes as such after having worked in what was then called bombay or mumbai now for around 8 years i came to the shows of uae and since have worked for more than 2 decades in what has become my karma bhumi india uae trade is valued at 8 and is at 60 60 billion dollars making in uae india's third largest trading partner after china and us moreover uae is the second largest export destination of india after the us we have seen the challenges thrown by covid-19 the timeline for recovery is still uncertain at the same time we have started seeing some light at the end of the tunnel with some countries including uae announcing vaccine rollouts in my mind the values of partnership and multilateral collaboration have become even more relevant today than ever one of the key lessons the pandemic has taught us is that economies need to become more local at the same time retain the global competitive advantage being more local at the same time doesn't mean one doesn't seek help or leverage itself with strategic partners mubadala has always believed in the power of strategic partnerships and collaboration we are ready to build the foundation to support india's drive towards self sufficiency or atmanirbhar as we are discussing today we have a long term vision towards india and its growth story as is strongly underpinned by an investment of over 2 billion dollars even during the pandemic why is india economic vision attractive for uae and for a company like mubadala now one one can go through various steps that the government of india has taken during uh, more recently in fact in putting a lot of robust and easier legal commercial and investor friendly framework let me take this opportunity of congratulating the invest india team varun spoke about it for winning the 2020 united nations investment promotion award going back to the investment landscape India has a target for a 1.5 trillion capex in the next 5 years. To finance this ambitious target, India has introduced various reforms including removal of dividend withdrawal tax, introduction of invit, reit and tax waivers for certain uh, sovereign wealth funds and other pension funds. Furthermore, the government is setting up a nodal agency of key secretaries from various governmental departments. who will handhold key investors in their investment journey also featuring the concept of a single point of contact As an investor, Mubadala has been at the forefront of FDI FDI into India. What we have seen is a, uh, some great investment opportunities that we have invested in India. Our most recent deal was a uh, 853 million investment into Reliance. Months back, we had invested 1.2 billion in the telco and digital services space, Jio, also a Reliance subsidiary. Last year, Master. our renewable energy platform had invested 150 million in hero future energies hero operates over 1.5 giga of capacity across wind and solar and is poised for growth as the renewable energy markets within india continues to expand 
with an announced range of 175 gigawatts of capacity by 2022 we certainly see a very promising outlook for the indian renewables industry which will help our platform in india to leverage upon these growth opportunities before our hero future investment the breed the largest district cooling provider in which mubadla holds a substantial stake entered into a 30 year concession for a contracted cooling capacity of 20000 refrigerated tons to build india's first district cooling system in amravati this by the way was tabreed's first plant outside the gcc market to show a commitment towards india tabreed had set up a, an office in india around 2 and 1/2 years back additionally through softbank's vision fund we have invested in eight indian companies accounting for almost 7 billion dollars these include companies like paytm oyo ola grofers flipkart earlier all in all we as mubadla we have invested around 3 billion dollars in india the atmanirbhar bharat program that we are discussing today calls for building a self reliant country india's infrastructure sector both digital and physical in my view and in in, in our company's view will continue to need a lot of investment and the build out of this infrastructure will be a driver of growth in other areas of the indian economy mubadla's experience in enabling infrastructure opportunities will will act as an enabler for india for us to transfer knowledge build capacity and also be a gateway for the long term capital to india our long term this is exactly our long term ambition as mubadla also there's a key point i want to just put in front of the august audience today Uh, investing in india is also proving not, to be rewarding not just from a financial perspective but also as a responsible investor looking to create change and uplifting communities through our investment we believe we are only at the start of our journey into india mubadla remains committed to the india story long term bringing together long term capital expertise in critical areas and a partnership approach to support india's ambitions i i thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity of voicing our, our opinion thank you uh thank you uh, shridhar especially uh, for uh, your focus uh, on uh, the renewable energy side and the new technologies and uh, and what you mentioned as the need uh, for continued investments into both digital and physical infrastructure uh, in india and the role that mubadla Uh, uh is playing and also adia is playing uh in uh, in this quest uh, for development uh, in india uh so now uh, we have finished all the presentations we are running about 15 to 20 minutes late uh, and honorable minister has uh, another engagement thank you sir for uh, for sitting through these presentations uh, we will have a few questions there are a few remarks that we have also comments that we have also received uh, on our social media channels uh and we would uh, want to wrap this up in about 20 minutes but first of all uh, i would uh, just request uh, all of you to thank and from my side thank uh, honorable minister uh, for gracing this occasion and we will then uh, take uh, some of the questions thank you all for the presentations that you have made uh, it was really interesting to hear all your suggestions i am sure that we will be working on those suggestions that you have made uh, anyhow our secretary Uh, is here he will be responding to some of the queries and in the in the coming days we will work in detail on those uh, suggestions and proposals that you have made so i am sorry that i have to leave now sir thank you uh, sir well uh, let me uh let me take the uh, opportunity
be there. Uh, so let me uh, let me first of all pose a question to uh, to Sridhar, and uh, that is on the food security uh, side. And I would also uh, request if Secretary General Fiki is here, uh, if he can also perhaps uh, respond to it, because food security is one of the areas, as, as we are saying, uh, you know, as uh, the Gulf is for energy security for India. If India could be similarly for food security for the Gulf, uh, and what more can be done in uh, in this sector? Uh, together, so that we can attract more investments into India on food security side, uh, and that would also help uh, the Gulf countries. So, if if someone, uh, Shridhar, if if you could say something on it, and uh, uh, and if any other participant wants to say something on on food security side. So, uh, thanks, thanks, Sirpal. In fact, extremely key and critical area for both India and the Gulf, and the COVID has just exacerbated the need for food security in general for every country. Uh, you know, the Gulf and uh, especially UAE and India have been working on this critical initiative for some time now. Uh, it, it is not Mubadala uh, per se working on this. But there are other agencies within UAE which are coordinating and cooperating and collaborating with India on this particular initiative. Uh, there is there's, there's a lot which has happened so far. There is still a lot of journey to be traversed, in fact, on the food security angle. Uh, there is is definitely you know a need for reforms which you see right now. In fact, India going through some of the farm reforms and all that, and also at the same time there is an opposition and, and a voice of protest. Uh, in general, in fact, I think the reforms are required, and it, at some point, in fact, you will see a more uh, open and a clean uh, way of trading in in, in food in, in general. So that's the local side of it. From an international point of view, in fact, what really would attract uh, investors is, is a, exactly a lot of all these reforms. In fact, nodal agencies, single point of contact. You know, we had a one-on-one -on -one with the prime minister in the recent past, uh, and these were exactly discussions that the prime minister was actually encouraging us to put forth on what, what do you what do you want to see? In fact, so it is not you know uh, some of my distinguished panelists spoke about tax reforms. Yes, of course they are required. These are actually financial benefits that one would gain as an investor. More importantly, what the financial investor is looking at is a is an open, robust, clean framework, so that you know the rules, regulations are not changing every time and every every sort of you know a regime changes in a particular state. In fact, the investor should be pretty much confident that certain framework of rules continue. Uh, so the, the, these are things, in fact, which we did voice with the Prime Minister, with the Honourable Prime Minister, when we had the one-on-one. -on -one. So I would I would like to raise these again. And there, there's, there's a lot the government has done, in fact. There's a lot the government is doing. And these are, you know, like the, the best part actually about uh, what we are seeing even today is, uh, you know, as a, as a government, as, as, a, as a body, in fact, you guys are ready to listen. And you're listening to the investors and also actioning these the suggestions that the investors are putting forth. So the, the listening part and the actioning part, I think keep doing it more is uh, what I would say. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Sridhar. Uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to come into uh, on the food security in, uh, side. Can I come in the lecture after Dr. Puri, please? Okay. Yes, yes. Yes, uh, please, yes. Mr. Dilip Chunar. No, I'll come in after Amin Puri, please. Dr. Puri, please go ahead, then I'll come in after you. Okay. Thank uh, you, sir. Thank I you so much. Aman is on us. Yeah, yeah, Aman. Thanks. Uh, sir, uh, <clears throat> as you're aware, sir, we just hosted the UAE-India Food Security Summit 2020 uh, in collaboration with Invest India and the CII. And one of the ideas which was discussed by the stakeholders in this sector was uh, the possibility of creating a kind of a strategic food reserve in the UAE, which could uh, support uh, the supplies, not only for UAE, but also for the entire GCC region and beyond, and the MENA region. So what is being uh, thought about is that, since some of the importers here in the UAE already maintain a buffer stock, the idea is to create that kind of uh, reliable source of supplies uh, the government of Punjab is also working on a proposal because they understood this idea and they feel that they would be in a position to make sure that they can keep some reserves 
uh, for for this region, uh, so to say, so that there is a buffer stock in the UAE which can actually be used for this entire region. So I think the stakeholders are working on this and uh, this idea could be looked at further. Thank you. Yeah, now Mr. Dilip Chennai. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, you know, I think uh, it, it, in the food uh, security uh, aspect, there are two uh, there are two different parts of it. One is, you know, the, the, the agricultural produce and the other is uh, value added. And I think if we can uh, get a lot of uh, joint ventures and partners going in the value addition part, and very recently, you know, in fact, it's under works. The government has allowed this uh, PLI scheme, which is a product rate incentive scheme, where actually you can form joint ventures to scale up uh, ready to eat and other such sectors, which will be an opportunity for uh, for uh, you know us to uh, ensure that there's a huge other supply going. And also the other aspect is there are many states where the reforms have already been done. Uh, so we can look at those states uh, and working with those states uh, and uh, seeing, because I, I, I'm aware of some of the conversations that Sridhar has had with different uh, states and other people have had with different states. So, you know, it's actually the integrated thing. Farming is one aspect, the logistics, you know, the whole thing to uh, cold chain, to port, uh, or, and, 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 you know, and, and the whole storage facility, like Dr. Puri said, you know, we'll have to look at uh, strategic, uh, increasing the strategic uh, storage capacity in, in the Gulf region. So there's a lot of opportunity there. And it, it, it makes actually business sense, uh, you know, for this. So it's a great opportunity going ahead. So if I can add uh, to this as well. Yeah, yeah, Varun. Uh, oh, oh, Varun, if you can wait, because uh, you have to speak on the other thing as well. Uh, I have our ambassador in Abu Dhabi, Mr. Pawan Kapoor, uh, who wants to uh, make a point. Uh, and I also have a comment, uh, someone who has said that uh, we should also consider having export promotion wings uh, through the PBD, of course, uh, you know, I think uh, not the PBD, these, uh, this is the general suggestion, uh, I think, for our embassies. Uh, maybe uh, Ambassador uh, Pawan Kapoor can also uh, handle a little bit about uh, this export promotion wing uh, thing, uh, this this, uh, this comment that someone has made. Uh, in fact, it's uh, Polam Vijay Kumar Yadav who has made this uh, comment on one of our social media channels. So, Ambassador Pawan Kapoor. Thanks, thanks, Vipul. Um, no, uh, you know, um, as uh, Aman has spoken about this side of the uh, uh, infrastructure, about the kind of facilities or a strategic food reserve to build. But I think uh, one of the very important things in which, um, you know, was obviously highlighted in this Food Security Summit uh, and what has been going, being talked on for a long time, uh, you heard Sridhar talk about their investments of Mubadla. Uh, the one big issue when Varun spoke about the 75 billion that has been committed in infrastructure, a fair share of that or that chunk of that of 5 to 7 billion is expected in what is called the India UAE Food Corridor uh, project. Now, this is a, a key one which has still not really taken off. And I think this is what we need to look at how we can, uh, you know, assure investors that this is where they need to come in. Now, there are some companies which have been in touch, of course, with Invest India. He spoke about DP World. He spoke about EMAR. Now, there are those who are investing in some logistics, warehousing, cold chain facilities of their own. But I think on the whole, the key factor that is holding this back is a decision on which state, the uh, you know appropriate land which is to be provided to the companies, etc., which is not clear. Now, Sridhar was very polite. When he spoke about the fact that, you know, Tabreed did this thing and in Andhra Pradesh, but he hinted at the fact that a change in the state's regime or the change in government uh, does not often lead to a continuation of its same policies. And I think in Andhra Pradesh, we have seen that to our, uh, you know, uh, to our own detriment. So this same thing is happening with us, even in the case of Maharashtra, where we are looking at a massive investment in the oil refinery by Saudi Aramco and Adnoc. And that is also still not moving forward and the costs have gone up a lot. I mean, without getting into details, the point is that this necessity of ensuring that policies that we, the government of India is pushing, stay, uh, you know, steady despite any change of state government is very critical for us. And I think that's the same point here uh, for the food security. 
but we definitely have to look at this food security project uh, uh, in, in India, that side, because there is, uh, as I said, and we spoke about here, the fact that the potential for employment opportunities in India, if you go in for this massive contract farming, is so much. Uh, the the uh, Mr. Jumal Keth, the Under Secretary from the uh, Ministry of Economy of the UAE, speaking at this summit uh, two days ago, talked about you know uh, two hundred thousand jobs. Now, when we are talking of Atmanirbhar Bharat, if we can create this kind of employment uh, in this uh, sector, that would be of, of of great help. So that's uh, the one point I did want to make. Uh, in terms of export promotion um, councils, I mean uh, you know the fact of the matter is that uh, I mean we are always open to more suggestions of how to uh, do this, but if the idea, I mean, we are, of course, working very keenly with our export promotion agencies in India. Uh, with APIDA alone, we've had a couple of uh, recent conferences bringing in uh, food importers from the UAE to see how we can improve, uh, you know, their facilitation of more imports from India. Similarly, we're working with the uh, different export promotion councils, uh, including on the engineering side, on, uh, on, on, on uh, food and garments. So we're doing almost every month, we're trying to do these um, uh, you know, um, events, of course, these days in the virtual mode. Uh, but now, you know, this is also leading to interesting innovation techniques. Uh, we've got these um, e-exhibition uh, of, you know, which, which people are able to participate in. Obviously, this requires a slightly different mindset, which we're all adjusting to. But whatever suggestions they are, we would be happy to take them on board. Thank you. People are forgetting uh, just you, add uh, to so what Ambassador said. Uh, yes, Shweta, please. Thank you. Thank you, Vipul. Thank you, Ambassador, for raising that point, in fact, about, you know, uh, challenges we have had in this specific, uh, specific investment. And this was one of the discussions we were having with the Prime Minister, saying as we have the Invest India Forum or the, or the hand-holding of an investor during the investment journey, you know, we need to have some type of a central agency or a central bureau, which is also hand-holding the investor throughout if at all there is an issue or a challenge during the investment. And that's more a central agency rather than, you know, uh, once the investment is done, the investor should not be left to handle the challenge on the, on their own. So that's another suggestion, in fact, uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the organizers. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Sridhar. I would now uh, want to give the floor to Varun. I think you have increased the complexity uh, for him because he has to now answer both uh, how to face the challenge of handholding during uh, the investment cycle, uh, and also I would want to, him to comment on the uh, on on handholding with respect to state governments. Uh, if Invest India can uh, can help us uh, in uh, in some aspects on on this thing, uh, I don't know if Varun is there, but if he's here, Varun, please, uh, if you can answer. Thank you, sir. I'm I'm, I'm still here. I hope you can hear me. Uh, so uh, you know, it's been an, uh, it's it's been a privilege to work with Mr. Azim and Mr. Anger in uh, facilitating their investments and. As I rightly mentioned, there are challenges on the ground in kind of converting those projects. And rightly, as uh, you know, Ambassador Kapoor and Dr. Puri mentioned also that food security is one critical element. And during the high-level task forum where the Honorable CIM was there, uh, you know, in UAE, that was one of the issues that was brought up. Uh, but uh, one thing I would uh, like to highlight and bring to the uh, knowledge of the, uh, the distinguished panel is that, you know, these suggestions have been taken into account and this work happened happening on ground onto these. So one key element what has happened uh, recently in the last two months during the COVID time is setting up of project development cells. Uh, each ministry has set up a project development cell which is now headed by the cabinet secretariat and there's a regular reporting and a meeting of empowered group of secretaries to understand how these mega projects or large projects are moving, what are the challenges either in terms of central government or state governments and how can we expedite. So, uh, uh, you know, officials at the level of joint secretary are taking review meetings at regular intervals. We do have meetings every week, every uh, alternate uh, week on different 
different aspects to understand uh, what what challenges are there and how can these be resolved. So that's one part on the project development itself. So the other part, uh, Mr. Azim also mentioned, you know, categorization of projects and, uh, you know, how do you license well between the central and the state authorities? So what is happening at the moment is we're trying to use leverage technology to bring in accountability into the system. So there's a single window mechanism which is being currently worked out. So as we speak, the process has already been initiated. Our teams are already meeting uh, different ministries, the central ministries, to understand how many different licenses are required, what are the redundancies in the system, how can you streamline it, benchmark it, and then kind of put an online system where maybe, you know, deemed approval and clear timelines are given. So this process is already in, uh, you know, this work is already in progress, uh, but it will take some time before we kind of see some action on the ground. In terms of state offices, what is happening is, uh, you know, we are in the process uh, and uh, it's been approved by our board and uh, the members as well. We are in the process of setting up our units in different state governments. And eventually what's going to happen is, you know, each state government would have a representative at the central ministry or the central body to kind of ease out the clearances in the whole uh, process it, itself. So this is work in progress, uh, but we expect by, you know, early next year, we will start seeing action and uh, results on ground. Well, uh, thank you, Varun. That's, uh, I think, good news. I think uh, that should uh, alleviate some of the concerns that uh, people have articulated here uh, and uh, which we have listened to uh, for, uh, for quite some time. Uh, I think now I will give the floor again uh, to uh, Mr. Nishad Azim. Uh, there were one or two uh, uh, queries that uh, we had uh, with respect to him on, on FIFA. Uh, there is also uh, one comment that we have received on our uh, social media channel uh, about uh, the opportunities of working on renewable energy uh, with uh, Qatar, apart from uh, apart from gas. I don't know if he can uh, handle that, uh, but yeah. if, if he can, that will be uh, good. So, Mr. Azim. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, with regards to, I mean, I was expecting this question because everybody is uh, excited about FIFA. And uh, also, the, the government is also very keen on, on promoting FIFA with the, with the Indian subcontinent and also expecting a huge uh, turnaround from the Indian fans to come to Qatar. And uh, as we speak, you know, there is a committee that the Indian ambassador, Dr. Mittal, is, and his uh, team are putting together along with the Indian Business Council to identify opportunities for uh, Indian companies to uh, come into Qatar. Uh, and and not only with the with the services but also with products and and one of the key concerns or one of the key areas i think in companies from india need to look at is uh, you know in opportunities are in fnb and and it and other services and also of course skill manpower which has always been uh, one of our key strengths uh, when it comes to fnb we say that india has a, or indian products has a huge uh, market share or relatively huge market share but that is from a captive audience. You know, you have you know seven hundred thousand out of the two point eight million are Indians. So definitely they will buy Indian products. I think what we need to look at as Indian companies is what percentage of the non-captive audience are actually buying our products. And if you look at that perspective, you know we'll find that our share is very very low. And why is that not happening? You know, we say, okay, let's promote export. Uh, let us uh, bring more companies in. But before we do that, what does the customer need? We need to clearly know what will sell. So one of the key things that we have found out was, of course, the packaging. So the way we package our products is, you know, relatively for the Indian consumer. You know, what we sell in India, we try to sell it straight away into the international market. That doesn't work. So you'll find a product that is, you know, made in India, maybe, uh, you know, equal or superior quality with a product that is made somewhere in Europe. And this could be like three times more expensive than the Indian product. But people buy this because it's well packaged, it's presented well. So this is an area where we would like our Indian manufacturers to, to look at uh, more keenly. And of course, we have opp opportunities in IT sector. Uh, there will be huge demands related to IT sector coming up. Uh, and of course, we, you know, anyone who is interested, we would be happy to support them uh, through the Indian Business uh, Council. Um, and manpower, is, like we said, is another key area. In terms of the renewable energy, uh, Qatar has a huge... Uh, project coming up, uh, for the solar farm coming up, and it is they've created a new company called Siraj Power, which will be, uh, and this project is under uh, Marubeni and Tutal, and in, and in partnership with China Power. So 
the predominantly most of the panels and all will be coming from uh, china power and and will be funded by these two investors and the power will be sold to saraj power and then of course into the local grid um we as a, a local manufacturer we are supplying some of the or we are planning to supply most of the support systems which is locally manufactured uh, in in, uh, in qatar so you need if you if anybody wants to look at renewable energy predominantly in terms of solar uh the key aspects again which you have to look at the climatic conditions you know the the we have surface temperatures are up to 73 degrees and there's a huge variance between temperature from day to night you know at night it could be about 38 degrees and at daytime surface temperature could be 73 degrees or 75 degrees so do our products can our products stand up to this sort of uh, uh temperature variance because you have to specifically make it for gcc conditions another what issues we have is in terms of the dust collection you need to have a coating on the system which will allow for easy cleaning or repel dust so adaptation of the product to the local market that is one of the key aspects if you want to succeed and be a major player uh, in the market and this is what i uh, think uh, every company uh, needs to understand that you cannot copy paste a product which is in, in back in india in, into the international market well uh, thank you uh, very much for uh... for your intervention uh, i think we are uh, running quite late right now uh, but i i do have a few comments uh, uh, that we have received on social media one is from mr rajpal tyagi a pbsa awardee uh, from kuwait uh, who has said uh, that there are lots of uh, investment opportunities in the private healthcare domain in uh, in kuwait and are there any special investment vehicles or mechanisms under atmanirbhar bharat uh, that will enable our industry to build a special partnership with kuwait uh, in this regard uh, we so i i'm not going to go into this uh, right now uh, because uh, all these questions i think cannot be taken but the point is well taken uh, and uh, i think on healthcare uh, it is well understood uh, in government of india uh, that uh, this could be one of the areas of focus uh, in atmanirbhar bharat Uh, and uh, we should have uh, different uh, ways of promoting this uh, abroad as well uh, the question uh, just to identify on the renewable energy on from qatar was missed by mr ayappa raj uh, vishwanathan uh, we also have some comments that we have received from bahrain uh, especially about food sector and entrepreneurship uh, that uh, perhaps uh, we would uh wish to connect uh, the questioner with uh, mr dadapai directly uh i'm not sure if any of the panelists right now uh, on any of the issues that we have covered if they want to make any intervention we i would uh, request them to do it uh, now uh, and then we would conclude uh, this panel discussion by concluding remarks Uh, from our secretary cpv and oia shri sanjeev bhattacharya ji so if anyone wants to make uh, any intervention right now please do tell us uh, i think mr dilip chinoy wants to uh, say something right now thank you i just wanted to say that you know on the renewable thing and uh, uh, with the particular state concerned uh, president fiki actually arranged uh, a series of meetings so there are two different issues in 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 the thing one is the planning of the new pps and the other one is the agreement of the, you know the, the agreement with the old pps so we divided the two issues and we actually had a meeting on the new pps with the investors the ceo of the joint venture companies actually flew down uh, and had a meeting and uh, i think there will be some movement on that uh, going forward and this just, just as an illustration that is there something even at the company level or something and they want us to work with the state government while uh, invest india you know does the wheels within government we will uh, try and navigate uh, other avenues as well so i just wanted to make this intervention thank you very much well uh, thank you uh, mr chinoy uh, i don't think we have uh, any other intervention right now so i would uh, request uh, secretary cpv and oia to make his concluding uh, remarks for this panel discussion Thank you Vipul. Um I think it's been a fascinating discussion, a very useful one. Um firstly the key points that came out uh, I, um the minister of state set out the stage. I think there is unanimity across all the panelists that 
uh, the historical nature, the very close connections uh, between the Gulf and uh, India do provide for enormous goodwill. And I think we have that as the basis on which uh, we proceed. Uh, traditionally, the relationship has been focused largely on the human resource and the energy security aspects. And I think some of the panelists also mentioned as to how they continue to be very relevant and how there are new kinds of opportunities that are present in both these areas. Uh, for instance, in the energy security area, uh, one of the panelists mentioned as to how uh, there are opportunities for new investments in the uh, existing hydrocarbon sector uh, in terms of infrastructure, pipelines, uh, technology, uh, and also in terms of renewable energies, because that is the way in which uh, the way uh, the Gulf is also moving and the greater sense of collaboration that is necessary. Also, the possibilities of third country partnerships uh, so that energy pillar will uh, continue to be very, very important and relevant. On the human resource uh, pillar as well, I think there were uh, mentioned and some of the, uh, uh, despite the changing nature within the Gulf, uh, we do see that there is a certain preference for the Indian migrant professional and the Indian worker as well, and they would continue to contribute to the, the development of the region. And in that aspect, there may be specific instances, for instance, the FIFA that is coming up, or specific expos that come up in which the Indians could play a very specific role. But what I gathered from the presentations of all the panelists was that they do see that the partnership is evolving and it has indeed evolved to a very large extent. And this evolution is now marked in certain new forms of cooperation, which will acquire greater prominence and salience. And two of these that came up were the aspects of food security and health security. And I think there are many mechanisms that are currently underway to try and reinforce and define what these two would be. For instance, uh, from Dubai, we, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, we heard how investments are being planned for these large farms, perhaps for contract farming, how there can be dedicated networks in which we can have these food links, how we can have better packaging, as somebody said, to appeal to the non-Indian uh, community uh, present over there, how we can get into other products. But I think when we talk of food security, that is in a sense a catch-all for what the trade ministers have been discussing about the trade in goods. And in this, there are certain other aspects as well, because as we look at uh, the question of, uh, of trade between our two sides, there are new items that have come up in terms of non-tariff issues, of uh, SPS issues, and uh, the residue levels that are there. And I think these are issues that we collaboratively need to resolve uh, when we, as we move ahead. The second broad catch-all area that was mentioned, and this was mentioned by several panelists, was the one about health security, about pharmaceuticals, healthcare systems, digital health, uh, and, and, and in a sense, I see this as the overall spectrum of collaboration in the services sector as to how we can then also work together on other issues like education, IT, uh, fintech, and so on. So I think those are some of the new emerging areas. What was also uh, discussed, and I think the modalities, is that obviously investments is becoming an extremely important element as we look at the cooperation and the partnership between the two sides. And in this, the role of the sovereign wealth funds is going to become increasingly important. The very useful presentation by Mudabla uh, said a, very, a couple of very important points, which I will just repeat, because um, Sridhar mentioned that economics needs to be local, but have global competitiveness. And I think when you have uh, competitive funding coming in, these are aspects that uh, would become important. Also, he referred that in the context of investing in India, in the context of Atmanirbhar Bharat, 
uh, the investment would not only be pref profitable, but would also give the signal of being responsible investors. So I think those, that, that is a very important pillar of investments that we will have to look at. The two other aspects, and I think in a, in a sense they're very closely related, is about the collaboration in technologies, particularly in high and emerging technologies, and in the resulting innovations and startups that happen. And I think if you look at this in a more holistic manner, we would see that the investment that Indian parties can probably have in some of the growth centers of high technology, or be it blockchain or artificial intelligence, or in the innovation hubs and startups in, in the Gulf area that are emerging, particularly, as somebody had said, the kind of leverage that the, uh, the buying power of the Gulf provides is that these will become great hubs, and India needs to plug into uh, these, these aspects. But also at the same time, we must be very cognizant that there are uh, several concerns. Uh, I do applaud the, uh, the presentation from Invest India, and not just their presentation, but their role in, in the manner in which they have been able to connect potential investors to the actual investment on the ground. But I think despite that, there were a number of issues that were brought up regarding concerns that we as a government take full note of and that we would wish to address. Some of these referred to the coordination uh, with the state governments, uh, the roadmap so that you know, you, you know what the timelines are, uh, whether a certain specific um, uh, forum can be created. And, and actually, in some ways, as I think uh, Varun also mentioned at some point, uh, this has been created to some extent, uh, that a special forum has been created for some of these strategic investments. But I think the state coordination, the roadmap, and I think the aspect about continuity of rules and you know policies, this is something that is extremely important. I know uh, Pavan also referred to that in, in, one, in, in his comments. So these are some of the issues that we do have to look at and address. But at the end of the day, uh, I thank you all for your excellent presentations because they provide us with a certain intuition and certain detail that is important as we craft our way forward. Uh, as you know, uh, we call the region now our extended neighborhood. And when we call a region our neighborhood, it has not only a certain uh, policy implication, it also has a certain cultural and fraternal affiliation. And that, in a sense, defines uh, the crux of the relationship that we are engaged in. So uh, let me say that uh, this augurs well for the partnership that we uh, seek to, to weave. We see there are there is momentum and dynamism in the relationship. We are... Uh, reinforcing our traditional areas, but we're also eagerly looking out for new areas of cooperation, at the same time being cognizant of some of the lacunae that are present in the system and the need to continuously be in reform mode. Uh, thank you very much for this lovely presentation. Well, uh Thank you, sir, uh, for your concluding remarks, which uh, it captured all the presentations and the interventions that have been made in this uh, fascinating panel, the fascinating discussion that we, uh, we had today. Uh, I would, uh, on my behalf, on behalf of the ministry, uh, want to formally uh, thank all of you, all the panelists, for joining us today. Uh, Mr. Dilip Chinoy, uh, Varun Sood, uh, Mr. Mohammad Dadabhai from Bahrain, Mr. Samir Ketkar from Oman, Mr. Pradeep Handa from Kuwait, Mr. Nishad Azim from Qatar, Mr. Vikas Handa from Saudi Arabia, uh, and Mr. Sridhar uh, Ayangar uh, from UAE. Thank you all uh, for, for joining us. I would also like our colleagues, ambassadors, uh, consul general to join us uh, for this panel discussion, and I would request them Join us for the next panel discussion on India GCC that we are going to have uh, from 3:30 uh, onwards for two hours, uh, where we would uh, be focusing on. Let me end here by thanking uh, all of you once again. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.